Hi, this is Bruce, the accounting guy again here today, and today we're doing inventory. Now remember, when we go, th when I do these little shoot videos for you, I want you to remember that they're non not inclusive with everything that is in that chapter. What I plan to do is go over three basic inventory calculations uh, with you. This is one of three exciting videos on inventory calculations. Uh, today's calculation will be first in, first out. Now the whole idea about using these calculations, and they're all allowable under generally accepted accounting principles, is, is that we are going to purchase goods and at the end of the period, the end of the month, the end of the year, whatever, what we're doing is, is we're going to go through these steps to determine out of all the goods we've purchased, how much we're going to put into our ending inventory, that means what's going to be inventory on our balance sheet, and how much is going to go into the cost of the goods sold, which is an expense item against the revenue we've earned that makes our income go up or down. Now there's three basic ones that we're going to go through here. This is the first of the three, and the first one's going to be called first in, first out. Now as I draw your attention over here to the chart that I have, this says cost of goods available for sale, and I want you to understand that this is in your text and that this analysis that we have here is just a presentation of the actual purchases of units for this company throughout the year. We will use this analysis in all three inventory costing methods, and we'll see that how we massage the numbers will actually affect our ending inventory and our cost of goods sold. So again, as we look through the data they've given us, they told us that on January 1st, we did have 100 units available and that they cost us $10 a unit. So as we extend it out, the cost is $1,000. That on April 15th, we purchased another 200 units and that they cost us $11 per unit. So as we extend it out, it's $2,200. On August 24th, they purchased another 300 units at $12 a unit, which extended out as $3,600, and that on November 27th, another 400 units at $13, and therefore extended out as $5,200. When we total all that up, we, all the units that we purchased throughout the year cost us $12,000, and that we purchased 1,000 units. Now, some assumptions you need to realize that are occurring throughout this year is, is that the cost of our units, as you can see, are rising, that every time we make a purchase, the units cost more. In some industries that will be true and in some others this dollar amount may fluctuate. But in all the analysis that we have that we're going to go over for this chapter, our costs are rising. And everything that we're going to learn would actually be the opposite if our costs were declining instead. Now before we do any of these uh, processes that we're learning to cost out th this dollar amount, we need to fit, complete the schedule. Sometimes you'll just get the, you'll get the dates and the number of units purchased and the cost per unit. You then need to extend it out to this final column to get this toss column. Now notice that this title says cost of goods available for sale. And what that is saying that is, is that this is the cost of all the goods that we purchased. And therefore, if we were able to sell all those goods, then this would be our total cost of goods sold. What we're going to do with these three different processes is learn how to massage this dollar amount and determine out of this 12000 if we do have goods left, how much of it's left in inventory. That means how much is going to end up on our balance sheet and how much of this will go against our actual sales. Now, in all these examples that we have, we are going to have, they've got to tell us either how many units we've sold or how many units we have left so that we can determine really how, how many units we really have left is the key. So if they tell us that we sold 550 units during the course of the year, of course, if we had 1,000 units to begin with and we sold 550, it means that we have 450 units left. And it's those 450 units that will determine the cost of our ending inventory. And that's what we're going to do now is we've got to decide out of these 1,000 units, which, 100, which 450 remain and at what cost. And once we can determine which 450 remain and we know their unit cost, that amount extended out would be our ending inventory. So this is our total goods available for sale, and now we've got to determine which of these 450 are left and at what cost. And to do that, there's three different methods that your, that your book shows you, and the first and one that we're going to do is called first in, first out. 
Now, under the first in, first out theory, it pretty much does approximate what really happens to inventory, especially if you're determining if this is a grocery store. Uh, with a grocery store, of course, we know that we would try to get rid of these 100 units of whatever this item is prior to getting rid of these because these would probably all be perishable and we want to get rid of, of course, the first units that we always purchase. So under first in, first out, the theory is, is that the first units in are the first units we have actually sold. So if we've sold 550 units, what we're saying is, is that the first 550 units would be sold, and there's two ways to look at it. We could say, well, we sold these then, and now we still have another 450. We sold these 200, so now we have another 250, and that means if we have 250 more units to sell, then out of this 300 uh, lot of units, we would remove 50, and we'd have two. I mean, we'd remove 250 of them, and we'd only have 50 left. So we'd have 50 of these at $12 and 400 of these at 13 And that analysis is down here. These 400 units would be remaining at 13 times that amount is 5,200. And these 50 units from the $12 would be remaining, and that would be $600. Therefore, we'd add them together, and that's our ending inventory. Another way to look at that, this as a little quicker without analyzing taking away the 550 each time is to start from the bottom and realize that if it's first in, first out, it's the first units in are being sold. That means the remaining units are left. And we could simply say we need 450 units. So we'd start at the bottom, 400 of these at 13. I need another 50, so I go to this purchase date and take those another 50 at 12. Now, as we work with each one of these purchases, books tend to call them and accountants tend to call them layers. So as, again, when I work with, the, with, this, with this purchase, I'm really working with this layer of 400, and then from the next layer, I'm taking 50. So again, I'm going to start using the word layers instead in, all, in, the, <clears throat> in the future two videos that we have on this inventory analysis. Now, again, the whole idea behind this was to determine out of this $12,000, what remains unsold. And we said there were 450. Here's the analysis of the 450 units and their dollar amounts now. And we totaled them up. It came out to $5,800. That's the amount that we would show as our ending inventory. Now, to determine our cost of goods sold, it's simple math. A calculation. We know that our cost of goods available for sale were 12,000. That was this number up here. And we simply take our ending inventory then of 58 and we subtract it and we now have a cost of goods sold of $6,200. And that's our cost of goods sold. The importance of that number is the fact that that goes on our income statement and we subtract that from our sales. Now, again, one thing I want to remind you about all three of these methods that we are going to learn is, is these are called what are, what are called cost flow assumptions and that we're allowed to use any of the three. But once we start using one, we cannot simply change from one method, first in, first out, to the next method we're going to learn, which is last in, first out, at a whim. We have to be able to show that it more clearly shows the operations of the company. So generally, if you start with first in, first out, you're going to stay with first in, first out. After we analyze the next one, last in, first out, which is different than this one, of course, then we'll take a look at tax ramifications and why one company may want to use one versus the other. So again, these are cost flow assumptions. This company, in this case, decided to use first in, first out. In our next up and coming video, we'll still use the same information and I'll show you how we massage, and some accountants use the word manipulate, the numbers to come out to totally different dollar amounts. So. I'll see you again real soon. So long now from Bruce the Accounting Guy.